One of the most important uh, categories uh, when preparing for your trip to the Seychelles is footwear. Um, obviously, on your way over there, it's kind of dealer's choice whether you're going to wear your flip-flops or a pair of tennies or something like that. But once you're on your destination, uh, let's talk about what you're going to wear, be wearing day-to-day on the flats. Now, it might be a hybrid system of sorts where you'll be fishing from the boat some and then hopping out quickly to catch a fish or something like that. You might be barefoot in that boat well, you know, so you don't stand on your line, but for a lot of the time you will be wearing a wading boot. Now, the Seychelles is much as it looks like white sand flats and all that fun stuff, it's actually a pretty gnarly place. Uh, lots of living coral, things like stonefish, cone shells, you name it. There's a lot of creepy crawlies, and so we really got to be pretty particular on what we wear out there. So I first want to talk about the boots, and then we'll kind of talk about uh, the sock system beyond that. And what we're looking for over there is something with a rigid sole, something that has good ankle support and ankle coverage, okay? This is a prime example. The River Salt's going to be a very solid boot. You can see a very rugged uh, Vibram sole there, light colored bottom, so it's not going to scuff up the skiffs. And it's going to give me that protection as I'm maybe stumbling through the surf zone or walking on the finger flat, something like that. Um, another example is going to be something like these flat sneakers or these new Orvis boots. Again, you're going to get that good ankle support, coverage, rigid sole, um, and it's going to give you the coverage you need. Now, this is probably your most popular flats booty you see out there on the market these days. This is really not going to cut it. Very minimal uh, coverage as far as the sole goes. Zero ankle support. We really don't want to see you traveling over there with these. This is not going to be a good fit for you. Now, in general, when setting up for which boot do I get, that's kind of what fits your foot best. They're all going to have a different last and things like that. But what's really important is you get the appropriate boot size. Okay, And what I mean by that is each company has a slightly different fit and then it really will also be dictated by your kind of uh, your gravel guard system so for example i wear an integrated neoprene sock with a gravel guard that's going to take up a certain amount of space in my boot okay versus let's say your more standard kind of synthetic wading sock with a gator gravel guard or cuff whatever you'd like to call it now why I say that is once you get out there, there's no take backs, you've bought that boot, that's what you're wearing for the week and it can be quite uncomfortable if you've gone a little bit too small. So really make sure they fit. Second is if you can, try to break them in. Um, they are very rigid to start. They're gonna be a little bit uncomfortable. So if you can't get out on the water, mow your lawn with them you know like try to try to get them a little broken up so or broken in so uh, they're more comfortable when it comes time now when talking about the system of the gravel guard and the sock and all that stuff everyone uh, kind of plays a different game when it comes to this uh, one thing to note is some people have a, a reaction to neoprene directly uh, contacting their skin so you know a, a system like this might not necessarily work I don't have that problem, um, so I do just wear this, and then this cuff will essentially fold down over you know, the top of the boot. You're going to be doing a lot of wading in sand and broken coral. Those little bits and pieces are going to find their way into your boot if you don't have a gravel guard. Now, the last thing I would say about these is it's just less to worry about. It's a pretty easy on and off not too many extra pieces to remember to, to kind of keep collected uh, throughout the week. Um, when I peel them off, I turn them inside out. They dry overnight, so they slide back on easy. The other system is going to be, yeah, again, a synthetic sock of sorts. Um, these are going to, you know, slide on nice and easy. They're going to be comfortable. You're not going to have to worry about any sort of neoprene irritation. And then I couple them with a gravel guard gator. Essentially, it's just going to be a Velcro system. That can then be put around the top of the, the, the cuff of the, the boot. So 
Uh, great system as well, does a really good job. It's just a few more pieces to worry about out there. That's the only reason I don't use them. Um, but yeah, a very common thing we see being used out there. Um, other than that, yeah, the, the last kind of sock you might find out there um, is a neoprene sock that's separate from the whole integrated system. This is also a great thing that you can couple with these, these gravel gaiters here. So another great option, comfortable, they dry out quickly. There you go. Next thing we're going to talk about is pack selection and what you're going to need for a trip over to the Seychelles. As I've mentioned numerous times at this point is uh, you're very limited on what you can bring over there as far as weight limits go. A uh, 33 pound check and 11 pound carry on. So as fly fishermen naturally we try to bring all the stuff that we probably don't need but really we got to exercise um, you know, really being diligent on minimizing that stuff. So when thinking about when you're out on the water, you don't have room for a waist pack and a sling pack and a backpack. You got to think about multi-purpose use here. So first and probably the most important pack that you're going to have out there is some sort of waterproof backpack. While the slings are nice, they don't quite carry enough and they're not really going to travel that well. Uh, this is the pack I use. I've been using it for years now. You can see it's a little beat up, but the pack is going to offer a, a great volume and comfort while I am traveling through the airport, pulling out papers, uh, getting my earbuds, all that different stuff. And then it's going to transition into a really nice fishing pack. So when, uh, you know, once you arrive, you're going to pull, pull out all your airport stuff. And then what I like to use, again, are some sort of pod system. I'm going to start using these for my rain jacket. I'm going to have either another, you know, more fancy style bag or even a Ziploc bag that's going to come in here. And like I said, my, my toothbrush and stuff is going to come out of this. This is going to be my leader and tippet. But creating kind of a system so you stay organized in these things, because once you open it up, it really comes down to pretty minimal organization. It's just a big hole that's going to keep your stuff dry. Um, and now imagine this kind of living on your, your back as you're fishing, and then it's going to be living on the bottom of the boat as you're you know, fishing from the boat. Um, so I like a system that's easy to get in and out of, a nice big zipper. These three options are great, Yeti, Fish Pond, Patagonia. And then, yeah, something that's going to have a durable bottom because uh, it's going to be getting lots of wear and tear out there as it's on the skiff, on the coral, on the beach. Um, and then I like to add some additional pieces. Maybe I don't want to deal with this big waterproof zipper all the time, so I'm going to look for some sort of auxiliary pack I can attach. As you can see, all these packs have some sort of system that you can attach a secondary bag onto. And that's going to be for my sunscreen or whatever the things are. I don't necessarily want to have to dig around and unzip for another thing I can just get quick and out of. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, those are all considerations when I'm picking out my waterproof pack. Then the next piece and the most common question that we get is what is your system um, when we are carrying a second rod and the answer is most of the time your guides are going to be carrying your second rod when you're out of the boat so don't overthink it too much when you're out there on the water or getting prepared for this trip but a simple solution or answer to this question is you know you're carrying your nine weight fishing for bonefish or trigger fish and you want to bring your 12 weight along because you don't know if that GT is going to come through the surf and you're going to want to have that extra rod on you. So essentially what I'm going to be doing is utilizing my waist strap. So as I'm you know, fishing out there with my 9 weight, I'm going to take my fighting butt and kind of just tuck it right here and then use my waist strap to keep that rod next to me and just kind of tuck it behind my arm. So that's as much of a system as you need. You don't need all sorts of bells and whistles to hold the rods and things like that. All these backpacks have a waist strap, so it's an easy system of carrying your spare rod without having to get too inventive out there. Um, next pack that's pretty important too is going to be what are you traveling over there as your checked bag? 
So we talked about before, you're limited with weight, you've got to check your rods, check your reels. So considering the style bag you're going to use is quite important because depending on if it's a roller or not, they're going to be heavy or, you know, it's not going to be long enough. So, you know, picking a nice, durable, lightweight bag that's the length of my rod tubes so I can stick it in there and it's not going to take up too much weight. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the different tools that I carry with me out on the flats and what you guys should consider bringing uh, as far as, um, you know, tools for cutting flies and taking uh, hooks out of fish's mouths and things like that. Just remember that you are going to be with a guide 99% of the time. So really don't get too invested into I need the best plier and all the nippers and all these different things. A lot of the time that guy's going to be tying the flies or he's going to be unhooking the fish. So when talking about tools, let's first talk about pliers. Having a general purpose saltwater plier is going to be great to have out there for sure. There might be that case where you stepped away from the guide, you've caught a bonefish, you want to release it, great. Um, when I'm talking pliers or what, what I'm looking for with these things is, first of all, that they have a narrow nose. And why I say that is typically the fish that has it deep in there or that's going to be dangerous to put your fingers around has a small mouth. And so you need something to be able to reach in there. I've seen a lot of pliers over the years with this really broad nose that you can barely stick into a fish's mouth. It drives me crazy because some of them are hundreds of dollars. Anyway, so first thing I'm looking for is a narrow nose so I can get into that bone fish or trigger fish's mouth and pull that fly out. Next, I'm going to open them up and kind of look inside here. I want to make sure I do have at least one flat surface so I can debarb. Uh, the Seychelles fisheries like Alphonse, Cosmolito and these places are a barbless fishery. Pretty rare out there for a saltwater fishery, but they are indeed a barbless fishery, so it's nice to be able to pinch a barb if you change a fly yourself. Next, obvious, is going to have a line cutter. Now, I've had very success from brand to brand and styles, whether it's off to the side like this versus in here. Um, definitely a nice thing to have. You can see these also have a bottle opener. It's nice to enjoy a nice cold save brew while in the water or after the water. And then the obvious thing is it's gonna have some sort of sheath system so you can attach it to a belt. Um, I personally, you know, not, am now wearing a belt outside my belt loop so I can constantly swivel this thing around to get it out of the way. If I lock it within a belt loop, I always find that it's in the way for some particular thing, whether it's casting or retrieving or whatever it is. So just a little thing I like to do anyway. Um, if you are not ready to invest into one of these because they are a little bit more of an investment, honestly, the good old forcep is a super awesome tool to have out there. Let's talk about that narrow nose real quick we were just talking about. This is the ultimate. This is for surgery. You can really get down in there. Still has a line cutter. Has a, a flathead screwdriver if I need to get into my reel or anything. Clips easy to my, my shirt. This is very streamlined. All the guides have them on them. These are such a great tool to have on there. So if you're not ready to invest into a more serious saltwater plier, just a, a pair of standard forceps is going to be really great. I would say the most, you know, um, I would say the bare minimum anyway of what you should consider bringing out there for yourself is a pair of nippers on a lanyard. So whether it's a more basic kind of trout style or something a little bit more involved that's going to last a little bit longer and cut some of those heavy leader materials. But this is comfortable. It just slides around your neck. It will put you into getting a fly on and casting it out and catching that fish that much quicker um, without having to rely on the guide. And yeah, it's I would say as a minimum, get yourself a pair of nippers on a lanyard and that'll be a great way to go. Well, thanks for watching and I hope this was helpful. Just remember you can find all this information in the pre-trip planner that we sent you. We'll see you on the water.